Wixner Conf. I'm very excited to be here. This is the first time that I get to talk to other Elixir users about Elixir. So previously I've just been sort of bait and switching my local movie group. <laughs> so I think it's Ruby, next thing you know, we're talking about Elixir. <laughs> so uh, my name is Richard Bishop, and the talk is titled The First Few Sips. And this is really uh, just going to be about my experience learning the language and really coming from an object oriented uh, background and learning Ruby. So, a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm a software developer and consultant. Like I said, a lot of Ruby, a lot of JavaScript, a lot of things. Um, I maintain a blog at ubiquity.com, and you can find me complaining on Twitter. So, um, from Calgary, coming here from Canada, and uh, recently moved there from San Diego, so love will make you do crazy stuff. And um, Elixir isn't really the only thing I'm sipping. Uh, two of my big hobbies, I'm really big into coffee. So this is my setup of how I make coffee. Very, very manual process. And I find coffee and software really similar. You start off trying to keep it simple, and <laughs> we end up very, very complex, right? So this is just human nature, this is what we do. Uh, and I'm also a huge craft beer junkie. I track down beer from all over the world. I love beer. I'm like a serial killer for beer. Like I photograph it, categorize it, store it, and I drink it. So that's that. So let's, let's sort of, before I really get into it, um, why Elixir? Really, why any new language? There's a lot of choices. So there's Clojure, and Go, and Rust. There's a lot to choose from. So the first reason, really, and what Dave talked about a lot, is curiosity and learning new things, right? So Dave told us we have to learn a new language every year, and we do everything that Dave tells us to do. So <laughs> take us to that. But we should be looking, right? Things are constantly changing. Uh, Think about when Rails was created, right? Our problem was all the boilerplate to get data out of the database and turn it into HTML. That's not really the case anymore. So new solutions arise, new problems arise. And two, I think, is concurrency. Uh, hardware is a lot different now than it was. And you know, I've been fortunate or unfortunate to work on some pretty big scale Rails applications where you kind of end up with really big Amazon EC2 builds. And uh, that led me to get more curious about concurrency in Ruby, but you're a bit limited there, right? It wasn't really a big focus when designing the language. You just have, for the most part, operating system processes, threads, and maybe some outdated event implementations. So that sort of led me on a quest, and then eventually how I ended up discovering uh, Erlang and Elixir and that virtual machine. And then along the way, I did write some node apps. And I found out that I'm not that good at being a scheduler. So anybody here who's worked on an Erlang scheduler, that's up to you. So the third reason would be maintainability. Uh, if you can't write maintainable software, what good is it anyway, no matter how fast it is? And I think Elixir gives you a unique combination of those two. So the talk is the first few sips, and like I said, it's going to be about my experiences with my background learning Elixir. I've seen some other people, or heard some other people say they've had similar things, so maybe you can relate, or it's just another view of how I went about it. And then at the end, I want to wrap it up with maybe a couple suggestions or things to think about to, to how we can be a more inviting language, right? It's 105 of us here today. Someone said it has to be 301 or 501 next year. So let's see how maybe some things we can do a little bit better. So with that, let's get into the first step. So being primarily a Ruby developer, you see the syntax, right? As programmers, we know syntax means nothing, but we can't help it, right? It's the first thing we do when we look at a new language. Okay, it looks like this, it's kind of like this. Or, oh, there's no way I'm going to use this language because it doesn't, you know, all I do see is that. So. so we know it means nothing, but we can't help ourselves. And when you start using Elixir, this falls apart really quickly, right? Because immediately, you're starting a functional programming in, in the, the language. So functional programming 
in my experience, has been really, really hard for about two weeks ago. Uh, tried it some of the other languages without much success. And uh, I have a really embarrassing story about functional programming. And uh, it's embarrassing because I thought I was doing it when I wasn't. <laughs> so uh, I, was writing, I, was, I was writing some JavaScript, right? And I was pairing with someone. And we were using this library called underscore. And it touts itself as functional programming for JavaScript. But in reality, it's a library that polyfills all the missing iterators into the browser. There's not really much functional about it other than iterators and such. So, so because of that, I didn't really see the merits of functional programming, right? Uh, there's a lot more to it than just iterative functions and uh, broken closures and you know, assigning or first class functions, right? A lot of languages have those these days, so, and they're not functional languages. So you could say I was doing faux functional programming, right? I don't know really <laughs> so, so with that, you know, again, comparing with my auditorium experience, you know, you spend a lot of time learning about patterns. Patterns, patterns, patterns. Pattern books, pattern block notes, everywhere, right? That is the solution to all your O problems, is patterns. And something that was refreshing is one night I was Googling, and I typed functional programming patterns in. And the very first result is, where are all the functional programming design patterns? And that made me realize, yes, I'm home. No more patterns. <laughs> so, you know, they might be out there, but I haven't really run into too many yet. So, along with functional programming, because just by itself it isn't a whole lot, there's a few other things that kind of go with it. And it's pattern matching, right? They've talked extensively about this. This is the best feature of the language. This is a requirement for me going forward. Any new language I've learned, I'm going to require pattern matching. So there's pattern matching for, for destructuring complex data, and then, but I'm also going to focus on pattern matching in function heads, which to me is, I look at that as a form of low-level control flow. Right? So I'm going to show a little bit of the code, and if we're programmers, we can't enjoy something without condemning another. So I'm going to pick on, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pick on imperative programming and, and object-oriented uh, programming a little bit. So has anybody here ever worked at a zoo or built a zoo app to model domain of animals before? <laughs> okay, should be pretty good for you all then. So, we have a function, it looks like Ruby, it could be any imperative language. It's called talk, but the main thing I want to highlight is this if, else if. Right? In an imperative language, this might be the lowest form of flow control you have, or a switch. So, we look at this animal, check out its type, it's a cow, we go moo, it's a pig, we go point point. Right? That's it. So, so object-oriented programming comes along, and languages usually have polymorphism. So we say, okay, you know, we can push that flow control a little bit lower, right? We make a cow, a pig class, a type, and then we use an animal presenter because everybody knows those are all the range these days. And then we use that common inter interface, the make sound method, as a way of controlling the flow of our application. So it's a little bit lower than an NFLs we've also introduced two new types. Whether you know, that's a win for you, in this case, maybe not. Uh, in other cases, it might be. So, so let's look at it using pattern matching in Elixir. We have a module called Animal Talker, and we have a talk function with two heads. And we're matching on a map, on the type key being cow or pig. So in terms of flow control, we've taken it out of the body of the function completely, and we pushed it up into the head of the function. And I found so far that this has helped me write so much more easily understood and maintainable code as I've been using Elixir. So let's look at another little ingredient that really helps us come together even more, and that's recursion. So, a lot of people will tell you recursion is just for implementing loops, but that's selling it a bit short, right? 
know, it's also for job interviews in languages that you're just going to get system stack errors. Right? <laughs> I don't know why. So many Ruby interviews I've been on ask me to do recursion. <laughs> and yeah, I know you can turn on tell call optimization at compile time, but if you have to turn a feature on at compile time in a language, no one's going to use it. So, so the big thing with recursion is it changes how you codify the problem that you're solving. You get to focus on what you're actually trying to solve, and you can push the outliers out using pattern matching. So, so let's pick on imperative programming some more. So this is, when I'm using an imperative language, this is how I, I tend to see how I go through writing my code. We start with what we're trying to do, and then we move to the outliers. And that really dominates our coding style in an imperative language. Right? We have early returns, or we might start off immediately branching to an if and an else. Uh, or, you know, and then after that, we might have some exception handling or more different returns. So, it really hurts us when we have to do all this because it ends up in the indent or code a lot. And a lot of us look at that shape that the indentation creates and we say, oh, that's, you know, we're heading in the wrong direction. So, what you realize is your, your programs in imperative languages, they kind of grow wider over time, right? All this, this branching. So, when you're able to use recursion and pattern matching, you're able to focus and flip things, right? You can immediately start focusing on the sub-problem, right? If you're building a reducer, that's, you know, looking at the head and passing the tail on. It's not, and then when you want to actually handle the case of when you reach an empty list, which can get ugly in, in imperative languages, you just pattern match the empty list and you stop. You can pattern match the nil. So when you code in this style, you notice that your programs tend to grow taller over time, rather than wider. And then another thing, key ingredient here is immutable data structures. So anytime you read advice from sort of the, the sage programs, they all say what, what differentiates a, an average developer from a great developer. They always say data structures, knowing how to use them. And in object-oriented languages, I find we kind of, we don't really learn how to use data structures to hide them, right? We, we do things like this, lots of classes like this in my object-oriented code, right? We have some sort of array or hash, we tuck it away inside of the class, and then we implement tons of behavior around it. We're not really using data structures any better. And then along with immutability, there's you know, in object-oriented languages, you're going to deal with a lot of state. Right? It's, it's like you're doing different things based on state. And I want to share this really great quote from Rich Hickey on state from his Simple Made Easy talk. It's a great talk. If you haven't watched it before, I really recommend it. But this is the, the definition he gives. He says, state is a specific value for an identity at a point in time. And when I heard that, I kind of went back and listened to it a few more times. Something was jumping out at me, but I couldn't quite figure out what it was. And then it, and then it hit me. And anytime you're a programmer and you see this word, it sh should send chills up your spine. So, do you see it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about time, right? Whether it's time zones, or hours, minutes, and seconds, or testing time. It is an absolute pain to deal with. And that's really what state is, is you're coupling values with time. And that adds a lot of complexity, as Richard he says. So getting rid of that makes your programs a lot more reasonable. So let's recap that first step. So we came in thinking, okay, you know, this is just Ruby on the Erlang virtual machine. And that's not at all the case because we have great support for functional programming, along with pattern matching, and recursion to really build understandable systems. So, get a sip before I move on to the next sip. Okay, so, second sip. We say to ourselves, okay, Elixir is like coffee script for early. I've heard this said so many times. <laughs> So who in here? Yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. This is like the next progression. And that's selling elixirs short for value, really short, right? Because the only benefit of CoffeeScript is that you don't have to write JavaScript. From what I understand, there's people out there that like writing Erlang, right? So, so clearly, if that's all Elixir offered, there would be nobody that would switch from Erlang to Elixir. So, so let's take a look and see why it's, it's more than just that. The first thing <coughs> is better tooling. Um, before I ended up at Elixir, I had some quick stops at some other languages. And it's really hard to get started with those languages because along with learning the language, you're kind of learning how you need to set up a few other things, dependencies, or your, you know, how you want to structure your projects. Or if you're using dependencies, everybody's got a different project structure. So Elixir has a mix. It's a fantastic tool for such a young language to already have. You can start a new project with the pretty same project structure. You have a test suite already up and running. It manages your dependencies. What more could you ask for when you're coming to a new language? It makes it so easy to focus on learning the actual language. And of course, we have hacks. So we already have a package manager for distributing programs and getting our hands on programs. The next thing you really notice is that Elixir takes documentation very, very seriously. If you're not writing documentation for your code, you have no one to blame but yourself. The first time that I ran doc tests, I think I just about flew out of my seat. <laughs> like, <laughs> how crazy is that? Right? Oh my god, an IEX session inside of our test that we can make sure is still valid as we change our code so we're not misleading people. Like, one of the worst cases with documentation is when it just gets out of date. Right? So we have a quick way of knowing that. And then we have different levels of documentation in our code that gets rendered differently, right? We can document modules, we can document functions, and then, of course, we can document types as well. And then there's a lot of convenience for getting at the documentation. We can easily look at it in IEX using the H command. And then we have xdoc if you want a web-based version. So there's really no reason to not be writing documentation or reading documentation. It's so simple and straightforward. So that's it for tooling. But the language also offers a few other features. Metaprogramming, right? So I have to admit, when I first came to Elixir, I wasn't excited about metaprogramming at all. I didn't touch it for the first few months. Because I still had a metaprogramming hangover from Ruby. So, but as you start to use it, you realize it's a little bit different. Number one is that we've learned, right? We've got the, the macro mantra. Never use a macro when you can use a function. So we're more responsible with our use of macros. Another great benefit in Elixir is that macro extension happens at compile time, not at runtime. So you can easily, more easily debug and reason about what's actually going on than just kind of running and seeing what happens. And another interesting thing is that Elixir itself is mostly implemented in macros. So we have if here. Implemented, and then we have a last implemented using if. So, so that changes the language, right? In a lot of languages, there's a lot of keywords that are sacred. You can't touch those. You can't change those. In Elixir, you, you can if you want to. You can extend the language if you want. So what's great about this is, in Elixir, you get to have one of the holy sacred things that whispers love, right? They really, really value what they call bottom-up programming. And you can have that in Elixir. You can build the language up toward your programming. So you do this with DSL and macros. And it's very intriguing. There's, you'll, you'll see some of it out there already. Um, and, but maybe we'll start to see some more of it. So let's recap that second tip. So we came in and we thought, OK, it's just CoffeeScript. As Erlang's ugly, but we realize there's quite a bit more to it than that. Right? We're getting actual language features. We have better tooling so you can get started and focus on your program rather than application structure and getting test suites and things to run. And then, of course, we have a robust macro system for extending the language and building our programs differently. 
So at this point, you're kind of coming around on the language a bit and done some functional programming. And maybe you can play with processes a little bit. And that's when everything really kicks <coughs> into overdrive for you. So you're really coming around, right? So you might say to yourself, wow, actors are they're more object-oriented than objects, right? If you, if you go off the, the old Dr. Alan Kay definition of you know, he envisioned cells and communicating with message passing, sort of realize all the object-oriented programs didn't really behave that way. But when you isolate your code into processes, it's a bit more like that. So, but there's quite a bit of conceptual overhead coming to this type of model. Um, and that's the actor model, right? It's really unfamiliar to you if you haven't used Erlang or, uh, or I don't really know of anyone else that's really using it. There's, there's implementations in other languages, but it's not the same when you try to bolt on you know, the actor model. Like there's celluloid and Ruby, and where actors are backed by POSIX threads, so you can't really have millions of them. So there's just nothing quite like a virtual machine that's designed for actors. And I didn't really get actors until there was this really off-the-cuff video of Carl Hewitt and this Danish guy with a really great tie-dye t-shirt, it's Eric Meyer, of course, uh, where they really explain, right, uh, what is an actor, what can it do, what can it do, and mailboxes. And you start to see how that relates to processes in Erlang, right? We have mailboxes, it's all done communicating using messages. So if you do concurrency in any other language, you'll spend a lot of your time messaging or messing with new texts, locks, right? Pushing something over here into a queue and popping it off over there. You don't have to worry about that in Elixir at all. Right? The early version machine takes care of that for you. The other thing with processes is this is where you finally can put some state into your programs whereas you didn't really before, but it's isolated. It's not just going to change up from underneath you. You have to tell actors to do things by sending messages. But when you start to play with processes, you try to glue together all these wacky little abstractions for doing different things with them, maybe like having a worker pool or something. And it's, it's really bad. It doesn't work how you think it is. And, and thankfully, we have this, right? So if we like to hate it, it's also there for us, right? So, so OTP is, is why a lot of people come to the language currently, or come to Erlang. And Elixir makes using OTP a lot easier. Right? There's a lot of boilerplate. It's very high ceremony to use OTP. And then what is OTP even? I feel like on a weekly basis, my definition of OTP is changing. Like one day I just think it's for servers and supervisors, and then Oh, and then you find out it's actually you know, a package of, of tools, right? The Erlang interpreter, the compiler, uh, a database, and then some other standard libraries. So it's confusing what it even sort of, what it all is. But either way, you should be using it and learning more about it because it's going to help you a lot. Right? Something you'll read about is people trying to implement their own version of a supervisor. But then, they don't realize all the stuff behind the scenes that OTP is doing for them, right? So we get a lot of error handling behind the scenes, logging, however it might actually end up looking, it's fine, and, uh, and messages. And then there's the whole other side of things too, more administrative for your programs, right? Handling releases and hot code reloading. So these are things that we like to brag about that we have for our programs. So to recap, recap the, the third set, you kind of come in thinking, okay, coming around, actors are more object-oriented than objects in a lot of languages. But it changes the way you create your programs, right? You have to start thinking in, in supervision trees. That's really the recurring theme when you're learning Elixir, right? Like they said, think differently. Everything is about thinking differently. And OTP is no different. But it adds a bit of clarity to your code because when things are running concurrently, you can usually look at your module and sort of picture it as that particular process. So finally, your last tip is that it's a language in its own right. 
right? We, we can stop these silly parallels to other languages that we use because they just don't really hold up. So to look at all four of them, we can strike the first two out immediately. It's nothing like Ruby. It offers way more than, Java, than CoffeeScript to JavaScript does. And then we can start embracing the things that really make it unique and make it useful. But the one thing, though, is to get to this point is it's a bit tricky. Because, because things are so conceptually different than we're used to, right? In, in other languages, your programs are almost always split up like in a typical web application. Something's serving requests, something's doing background work. And they're probably in different processes. And they're probably deployed differently. It's a bit not like that. So I want to quickly float some ideas and talk about some things that I think we should consider to kind of make the language a little bit more inviting or you know, so we can get to 301 people. The first thing is productivity. That sort of your step from first using the language to creating something that you find cool. Now, there's, you can't get around having to learn functional programming. Um, that's, just, that's just part of the deal of picking up a language like this. But there are some things that maybe we can do to, to help build things that make people feel good, right? For some reason, whenever someone looks at a new language, they like to be able to build web applications or just return a 200 OK and a string hello world. Uh, I don't know if. I'm sh actually, I'm sure everybody here can close their eyes and picture the Node.js and Go HTTP handler implementations, right? That is like the, it's, it's just all around the internet, right? You could be laying on the beach and a jet will drive by with the implementation of an HTTP handler and Go. Like, that's just really how they get people to use the languages, right? So people are excited to set up an HTTP handler. So maybe we should think of a way to make that easier for people to do. Uh, or connect to a database very easily. Or you know, fire off an HTTP <coughs> request. And like I said, there's overhead to getting to that. You have to understand a little bit about processes and functional programming. But could we use maybe a little more, as we like to say, magic at first? Think about if you come here from Ruby, when you first started with that language, everything feels magical, right? But you're still able to get stuff done. And then as time goes on, you work with the language a bit more. You start to understand the language. Magic isn't around anymore, right? Because you understand what's actually going on now. The next thing is our elevator pitch. You know, how many people rant and rave about Elixir, and then someone comes up to you and asks you, oh, you know, what, what's Elixir like? And then all these words just start fumbling out of your mouth. Fault tolerance, distributed, concurrent, right? <laughs> but like, what, is, what does that mean to someone who does, maybe doesn't even have those issues, right? Elixir is a pretty good language all on its own. It doesn't have to just be used for those types of programs. You know, we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves. So, so let's look at Elixir's description. You can see that it's, so Elixir is functional metaprogramming aware language built on top of the Erlang VM. It is a dynamic language that focuses on tooling to leverage Erlang's abilities to build concurrent, distributed, fault tolerant applications with hot code upgrades. Wow. Whenever I go to look at a new language, I'm more interested in why I should use it uh, and not so much as the what. Yeah, they're tools, but you have to figure out sort of why. And with a message like this, we're kind of still sitting in our, our ivory Erlang towers, preaching about all these awesome things we have to solve your problems, or maybe these aren't your problems. So, so let's contrast that with Ruby's description. See what I did there with the colors? Very programming language color theme talk. <laughs> so, so Ruby, a dynamic, open source programming language with a focus on simplicity and productivity. That's the why, right? If you're looking at that language, you say, wow, why? Wow, simple and productive. I wonder how. Now you can check it out and find out 
how those things are true. So we were curious. We want to we want to check the language out. So I'm a programmer. I'm not a marketer, <laughs> but uh, I'll take a stab at what I think might be a better description for Elixir. Because if I'm going to criticize it, I should at least offer up something. Otherwise, I'd just be a jerk. <laughs> so this is what I'm thinking: a dynamic, functional language designed for building scalable, maintainable applications. So that's the why. Why would these are important things now? Scalability and maintainability is always. So if, if we pique someone's interest now, now we can show them what and how, right? Now we can show them well, the Erlang virtual machine and lock-free concurrency and hot code updates or upgrades. So I've really enjoyed working with a Wix and a lock, right? And it's a joy of, of a of programming language to use. So I think it has a really bright future. Thank you. So your products, uh, yeah, not so much. So um, would you be in favor of expanding the docs language to support more annotations like Yard has as opposed to Ruby docs versus Freeform? Because if you're doing both spec and docs, having a return type that does the spec for you would be really nice, and you would have to do spec at the same time. I guess in general, would anyone think a more feature-rich doc language in XDoc would be helpful? I really like Yard and Ruby as opposed to RDoc because it makes it more standard and more parsable. But some people are like, too many type annotations. I think right now it's, it's pretty hard to pick on documentation in Elixir. Um, I, from what I've found, it's the easiest to use so far in other ways, compared to other languages. I didn't use Yard a whole lot, so unfortunately, I, can't really compare those features. Oh, thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you.